Freddy vs. Ash, the Fan Novel, by A.S. Eggleston. Chapter 10 Evelyn and Jill couldn't help but laugh the idiotic display of cheesy masculinity being shown before them. They both leaned back by the wall, acting as bystanders to the party going on around them. Evelyn kept her eyes locked on Cooper as he did his little dance. Yeah, he's kind of hard to deal with sometimes, she thought, recalling back to the incident earlier that day. But... I know he's just trying to look out for me. Evelyn looked over to Jill, who now was scrolling through messages on her phone. I guess the entertainment around here didn't meet up to her standards, Evelyn thought. As she turned to her right, Evelyn noticed that Faith was absent from the room. That's funny, she thought. She was here a minute ago. She looked around, trying to spot her among the barrage of people. Evelyn looked around the living room, and she leaned over to peer in the hallway across from her. She had no such luck. Evelyn was about to lean over to Jill and ask where Faith might have gone when she felt a slight push on her shoulders. Evelyn quickly looked back to her right and saw that Faith had already made her way past Evelyn and strode towards the couch where Cooper was finishing up his victory song. That's how I roll. That's how I get all the ladies. That's how I roll. That's how I get all the ladies. Cooper danced in his seat, waving his arms in front of him. Stephen had become frustrated at this point. He desperately wanted Cooper to lose just once. He brushed his brown, choppy hair back with his hands. Shut up, he yelled at Cooper. This happens every time we play, man. Kyle sat up from the couch cushion. You two take this stuff way too seriously, you know that? It's getting kind of old. He leaned over to his girlfriend. Come on, Meg. They made their way out and away from everyone else. They held hands as they walked through the hallway and up the stairs. Faith now stood directly in front of them. She motioned her hands to Cooper and Stephen, telling them to make a spot for her on the couch. Move over, ladies, she said confidently. Make room for someone who can play with dignity. Faith playfully grabbed the top of Cooper's head, moved him out of the way. She landed on the cushion while Stephen handed her the controller. The level started and they began to play. Cooper looked back and forth between Faith and the TV screen. I'll have you know, he said, acting cocky, that's my record for beating someone is like two minutes and seventeen. Cooper cut himself off when he felt his controller rattle. He saw a grin appear on Faith's lips. Cooper fell silent. But Cooper thought, Call of Duty's my thing. And you're dead, Faith taunted him. She jumped up from the couch and stood up straight. She danced, mimicking Cooper. That's how I roll. That's how I get all the ladies. Oh my God, Stephen exhaled. Thank you for that. I thought he was going to do that stupid dance all night, he said to Faith. He was impressed by Cooper's notable silence. Stephen saw that Faith had extended her arm in front of Stephen, offering the controller back to him. His fingers touched hers as he took it back. Any time... Faith bent over to cup Stephen's face in her hands and kissed him. God, I love this woman, Stephen thought. The kiss lingered for a few seconds until she quickly let go of him. Hmm, I like putting men in their places, she said. She turned around to walk off. The flannel shirt tied around her waist twirled as she swayed her hips and joined Evelyn and Jill. There was a moment of silence between Cooper and Stephen. Cooper stared with widened eyes at his friend. He was a bit surprised at what he had just witnessed. Dude, Cooper marveled. I still don't understand how you got her. You're a nerd with emo hair. How did you do it? He wanted to ask him that question, but quickly retreated. Then he realized that Faith was a bit of a nerd too, unlike Stephen, who was as shy as a stray kitten when it came to women. She was just confident, and apparently they liked that about each other. He slowly turned his head to look at Cooper, his face still fixed in an expression of shock and excitement. That's how I roll, Stephen said. Bitch. He quickly turned back to face the screen as if it never happened. Hail to the king, baby. Ash flung the front door wide open. 
The bright red mahogany door slammed against the wall as Ash leaned against it for support. So tired, Ash thought. Can barely stand up. All of his weapons, his chainsaw, shotguns, and pistol, were hidden away in a duffel bag he had slung across his left shoulder. The bag was worn with various dirt and blood stains from adventures past. He slugged across the room, dragging his feet on the floor as he headed for the basement. Ash turned the doorknob and opened the basement door. He slowly descended down the stairs. His feet slammed against the steps as if they were made of concrete. The words the demon had spoken to him had resonated with him. In fact, it more than resonated his own thoughts, because they were clouded from the deadite's words swirling around his brain. It was like an echoing tornado around his head. The thing that he hated the most was that she was right. He couldn't deny the fact that he was getting weaker by the day, and he just couldn't explain how. Ash stepped in front of the workbench and set the duffel bag in the center. He unzipped it and laid out his weapons to wipe the blood off of them. He reached for the gun cleaner on the shelf above the bench and grabbed an old wash rag from the corner. He was about to clean the blood from his shotgun barrels when there was a creak. What was that? Ash thought to himself. Ash whipped his head in the direction where he thought the sound came from. He turned around and surveyed the basement. His eyes went towards the old furnace next to the stairs, in the far right corner of the basement. Creak. He heard it again. This time he was certain that it came from the furnace. He decided to move towards it and find out what was causing the furnace to moan all of a sudden. It was so laden with rust that it seemed impossible for the thing to function properly. For the entire time that he'd been living in the house, he never paid close attention to most of the rusted and dusty items in the basement. If it wasn't right in front of him and didn't serve a purpose, it might as well have never existed. Ash stood in front of the furnace and kneeled down to get a closer look at it. Cobwebs surrounded it from the bottom. Ash stared at its rusted iron gate for only a second. When the gate flew open in front of him, he was taken aback. How in the hell? Ash thought. Ash looked closer until he could see the old furnace's interior. Immediately, he saw that it was covered in ash, dust, and more cobwebs. He noticed something else buried beneath the dust, as if it was meant to be hidden away. Ash reached his hand inside to pull it out and see what it was. He brushed through the debris until he felt something. Okay. It's something wrapped in some kind of cloth, Ash thought. Ash felt a sharp cut slice through his index finger. Ow! He exclaimed. Is there a knife in here? He asked himself. He brought it out so he could see it with his own eyes. Whatever it was, it had been rolled up tightly in an old dirty cloth. He unwrapped it as quick as a five-year-old tearing away the decorative paper on a Christmas present. What he had just revealed was an old welding glove with aged copper plating on the back and the fingers and long still blood-stained razor blades on the tips of those fingers it was freddy's glove he could feel it the longer he held the glove in his hands he started to feel dizzy and nauseated like the whole room was spinning around him it just laid in the palms of his hands the copper plates clanking against each other as ash's hands shook he was now convinced he knew now that there truly was another evil following him, a dark and shameless thing weakening him, removing his sanity, trapping him. Freddy was coming to get him. Ash felt like he was about to vomit. Oh, God, Ash said. He dropped the glove onto the ground and tried to get back up. He slipped and stumbled in the process, but eventually managed to stand. As he tried to keep his balance, he walked back to the stairs. He knew what he had to do now. That damn book, he said, trying to find something to balance himself with. It's your fault for everything, he said. Because of the Necronomicon, Ash's entire life had been ruined. He was destined to a life of hell on earth. He wasn't going to put it off any longer. If the book was destroyed, so would his torturous life be as well. At the very least, there was bound to be some sort of incantation to trap the evil back again. Ash hoped that he would be able to read it. Ash prepared to step up the stairs.
Flash froze for a second and shifted his body to look around him. His foot stayed on that first step. He heard that low, sinister laugh that had now become so familiar to him. You again? Ash realized. You're here, but where? Ash looked all around him, but found nothing. He slowly turned back, feeling the hairs on his neck spring up, and he moved away. Freddy stood beside Ash, watching him squirm. He smirked at the sight of his shaking hands and the cold sweat appearing on his brow. He was weak, and the time to strike was now. Freddy had waited for this for so long. He had not just another chance to return from the dead, but to gain eternal life, a power he could have never imagined possessing before. All he had to do was wait for the imbecile to fall asleep and then the fun could begin. In his dreams, Ash would be vulnerable and susceptible to Freddy's powers, however weak they were at the time. But it would be just enough to enter his mind, read the incantations of the Necronomicon through Ash, and Freddy would be unstoppable. Your soul is mine, Freddy said, but his words went unheard to Ash. Much like Freddy, they were lost between the spaces of the living and the dead. Soon enough, the endless torture being bound in a purgatorial state of entrapment, the desensitization of not being able to run his blades against the flesh of some ripe, screaming bitch. Soon it will all be over. Freddy's patience was starting to wane. He had to wait for Ash to fall asleep before he could do anything. Until then, he just watched as Ash was becoming debilitated by the second. Ash took it one step at a time as he reached up the stairs. I'm going to take care of that book once and for all, he vowed. He leaned against the wall to keep from falling backwards. He felt like the ground was moving below him. Utter blackness formed out of the corners of his eyes. He knew he was probably going to pass out within the next two minutes. So he tried as best as he could to hurry to his car to, to get the Necronomicon. With it, Maybe he could undo the whole mess. I can't waste any time, Ash thought. He was now at the top of the stairs, about to reach for the doorknob. He suddenly felt a chill race across his spine. Clink! Ash paused for a moment. That noise. He had heard it before. It sounded like a metal clanking against metal. He had heard it when he pulled that glove out from the furnace. Freddy had flicked the fingers of his gloved hand apart, hovering his razor-sharp blades just above Ash's scalp. He couldn't wait until it was time to put those knives back to work again. Out of his frustration of being restrained from the blood, violence, and violation, Freddy couldn't help but allow a smirk to emerge from the corner of his mouth in anticipation. Hail to the king, baby. Ash pushed the door open and fell down to his knees on his way out. In addition to his nausea and dizziness, his entire body stung in pain. He felt as if every square inch of his skin was being poked with needles. He managed to get back up, but with each step he took, he could feel the waking world slipping away from him. The pain quickly escalated. He knocked against a shelf in the wall as he was leaning against it. Knocking over vases, books, and other knickknacks he didn't really give a damn about in the first place. Finally, he couldn't hold himself up anymore. Ash dropped to the ground, holding himself halfway up by his elbows. He couldn't figure out which he was going to do first. Pass out, throw up, or cry out in agony. The pain was excruciating. He wanted to die, just so he wouldn't have to endure this vexation any longer. He'd felt this kind of pain before but not to this degree. This was such an exaggerated and raw discomfort. It was as if his skin had been peeled, leaving only his nerves to be exposed to the harsh environment around him. The only time Ash had experienced this agony was when the forces of the Necronomicon had come to him in an attempt to claim his soul. 
God, that was horrible, Ash said to himself. As he recalled, he had only been possessed by the foul things only a few times, and a few times was enough. But this, this is like a thousand times worse. Ash yelled in agony. Ha ha! He writhed around on the floor, begging for it to stop. Droplets of sweat raced down his forehead as he panted, feeling like he was losing oxygen. He looked up at the ceiling. Everything he saw looked like it was moving around him like a merry-go-round. He wondered how many seconds he had left, and what would happen when his time was up. <laughs> Not so tough now, are you, Ashy? Freddy taunted Ash. He was kneeled over him, his head cocked to the side, marveling at the sight of the supposed chosen one, lying flat on the ground like any one of his own victims. Freddy writhed and twitched the razor blades on his fingers around playfully. Ha 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 ha! His laugh echoed through the spaces beyond. Time for this hero! to step down and let the master take over, he said. Freddy flicked the blade on his index finger up. With his left hand, he grabbed Ash by the throat, holding him down. Freddy could hear the pathetic excuse for a demon slayer gag and gasp for breath. Now, his voice was life. Let's see how strong you really are inside that weak little brain of yours. Huh? He cocked his elbow up, aiming his razor blade dead center between Ash's eyes. Quick as a bullet, Freddy pierced through the base of Ash's skull. Ash felt a sharp pain in his head. The phrase splitting headache didn't even begin to describe it. Ah! He screamed again. He could feel it. It was happening again. Ash knew that right at that very moment, something had taken control of him. Something that had come back from the dead. And that something was none other than Freddy fucking Krueger. Ash felt his breath slow down to a pause. And everything just went... Black. Ash's lids opened, revealing a set of eyes that did not belong to him. They were pale blue and black around the edges. Ash's face had been contorted and twisted until it resembled nothing like what he looked like before. He looked like pure evil. The lines of his mouth curved upwards, forming a sly smile. He had slight burn marks on the side of his face. This was no longer Ash Williams, mild-mannered stock boy destined to fight the evils of the world. This was the haunter of everyone's nightmares, the ultimate boogeyman, the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. Ash had become nothing but a vessel for Freddy Krueger at this point in time. Freddy jerked upwards until he sat up. He stretched his arms and neck, getting used to the body, now in his possession. He stood up and slowly turned his head to the front door. Now, Freddy said to himself, where's my book? He flung the door open wide and strode across the lawn until he reached Ash's Oldsmobile. He stood, wide-legged with his right shoulder slumped lower than the left. He was so used to having his trusty glove on him at all times that he couldn't position himself any other way. Freddy felt around the pockets for the car keys. He opened the trunk, and there it was, right in the middle, calling and beckoning to him. Without a second thought, he grabbed the book and slammed the trunk. He entered his home and kicked the door closed behind him. Freddy paced to the kitchen counter and set the Book of the Dead in front of him. He flipped through the pages, looking for the resurrection passage. Freddy ran his finger across the page. All right, let's see here. He searched for the passage that would bring him back from the dead. Gotcha, he said. 
He took a deep breath and began the phonetic pronunciations of the Necronomicon Ex Mortis. Kenda- uh, <coughs> Out of the blue, Freddy felt a punch land squarely in his jaw. It was his own left hand. Damn it, Freddy thought. This moron wants to fight back! With his left hand, Ash took back control of his body and landed another punch at Freddy in his abdomen. While it was his own body and it hurt a great deal, he knew that Freddy was the one taking most of the damage. The punch caused him to double over. Ash's voice had now taken over. I'm not letting you read from that book, you undead bastard, he said. Freddy was back in control. Looks like you don't have a choice, stubby, he yelled. With Ash's metal hand, he grabbed him by the back of the head and slammed his head against the counter. Slam! Over. Slam! And over. Slam! And over. Ash pushed himself up. He wiped the blood from the corner of his mouth. Is that all you've got, Freddy? He taunted. I've done worse to myself. Before he knew it, he felt himself reach for the Necronomicon. Freddy didn't want to rush this, but he had no other choice. This was his only chance. Kanda! Estrada! He struggled to say the words. Suddenly, he felt Ash shove the book away and watched it drop to the floor. I'll be damned if I let you live again, Ash said. Freddy retaliated. Why can't you die like a good little piggy? He jumped over the kitchen counter and grabbed the Necronomicon off the floor. He panted as he recited the words, Demontos! Nosferatos! Soon after, Freddy felt Ash shift his body to the left and hit his knee straight into the counter. Oh! Freddy screamed in pain. With his left foot, Ash stomped on his right foot, causing Freddy to scream in pain again. Freddy reached over and grabbed a butcher knife and held it to Ash's throat. Before he could make contact with his left hand, Ash blocked Freddy, pushing the knife away from him. He strained to keep Freddy from slicing his neck open. He felt the hand that Freddy was controlling begin to lower and quickly slice across Ash's left forearm. It stung like hell, and Ash shouted in pain. Freddy held the book to him and resumed the passage. From outside the house, deep in the darkness and in the night, the evil and powerful forces of the Necronomicon roamed the dark bowers of man's domain. It traveled faster than any man or beast. The entity emerged from the dark unknown and into the seemingly peaceful area of suburbia. It entered Elm Street. It lived and followed the words of the Dark One, its master. It followed the words echoed by Freddy Krueger. Kanda. His words became louder. It knew exactly where to go. Demontos! At the very center of Elm Street, in front of the house addressed 1428, the entity shifted and came ever so close to the door. Freddy reveled as he spoke the very last word of the resurrection passage. He spoke it wickedly. Kanda! He growled. The entity burst through the door like an explosion. The chorus of demonic voices howled and shrieked bloody murder. The forces of ancient evil met with its new leader and became one. Energy and light fused together and exploded like a flash of lightning. Freddy separated from the meek little vessel known as Ash Williams and was now fully resurrected. Charred skin, ugly sweater and all. Ash gained full control of himself. He felt worse than he did when he was possessed, but at least he was himself again. He heard a low breathing noise. Ash looked up and saw that it was Freddy. He stood tall, asserting his power over the weakened and defeated Ash. Freddy smirked and laughed softly. Ash! <laughs> Freddy launched his razor glove straight at Ash's ribcage. He had grabbed it when Ash wasn't looking. Ash felt a smothering pain in his chest for a fraction of a second until he awoke. Ash shot straight up. He realized what had just happened. There were four small puncture marks in his ribs, but they weren't fatal. He was still alive, but he couldn't say the same for everyone else. No, he said. He had found Evelyn and the rest of the kids.
Hail to the king, baby. <laughs> Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 10 of Freddy vs. Ash by A.S. Eggleston. I want to talk for just a second. I sincerely apologize that it's been so long since the last set of chapters. I don't know if everybody knows this, but so far in the year 2023, <clears throat> excuse me, I started the year having a stroke. It was a minor stroke, but it was a stroke nonetheless. And I've had another minor one since then, just a few weeks ago. And also, my father passed away in May. Every time that I came back to sit down and narrate, something would happen. It's just been a bad year with a lot of bad luck. And I'm dealing and have dealt for many years with depression and anxiety. And when I'm doing the riff shows, or the podcast, or the review show, or out of print slashers and after the slash, I'm with somebody else doing the show. But when I'm narrating, I'm all by myself, and it's hard not to get into your own head whenever you're dealing with depression, losing a parent, facing the great chance that any day you could have a stroke that might end your life. It's, it's a very scary thing. But I've had some time. As of right now, I think I'm okay health-wise. Um, I'm still dealing with depression, but that's going to be for the rest of my life, probably. But I'm going to do my best to get more narrations out here on the channel. There's still a lot of books I want to read for you guys, and I want to get to them. So as long as a medical situation does not arise that I can't control, I will be back very soon with more chapters from this book. That being said, I really do love this book and it has killed me waiting so long to get to see what happens next because I even had to go back and listen to the last chapter, guys, because I forgot how I did some of the voices. Yeah, it's been a minute. I'm going to have to do the same thing when I finish Final Destination, um, Destination Zero because I started that one like two years ago and then went on to other books and said I would come back. I'm still coming back to that book. Um, but if anybody can find me Final Destination 1 and 2, the books, uh, give me a holler. I need to at least get digital copies of those because I want to narrate those in the future too. And I don't know where my uh, Final Destination guy went. <laughs> he's a, He was a good friend. I'm not going to say his name online in case he don't want me to, but uh, he supplied Final Destination 3 and stuff like that. So I really hope that uh, I can get a hold of him and also, if not, find digital copies of those two books so I can narrate them. I really enjoyed tonight's chapter. I'm about to edit in all of the uh, sounds and stuff. I'm going to have fun with that, I think. Uh, I was hoping there were some Deadite voices because I love doing the Deadite voice and making that effect for you guys. Uh, let me know what you thought of tonight's chapter. I thought it was really interesting that Freddy actually possessed Ash in a dream uh, or whatever and read, read from the Necronomicon. And the demon and the, the deadites are there, you know. Uh, the only thing I'm confused about is at the end of the chapter, he said <clears throat> he had woke up. He didn't have a fatal wound. And he had found the other Evelyn and the other kids. Does that mean that while he was sleeping and Freddy was in control, the book reading, ha the Necronomicon reading happened in the dream and in real life, Freddy used Ash's body to kill Evelyn and all the kids? Or is he saying that Freddy found the kids? Or is he saying that he woke up from sleepwalking at the kids' house? I don't know. I'm reading this for the first time, too. Any book that I've never read, that I narrate, I make sure when I narrate the chapters, it's my first time reading it, too. So you guys and can enjoy it, and I can enjoy it along with you for the first time. Sure, if I read it, the chapter before narrating it, it'd be easier to edit, maybe. But uh, it's not that much work. Sometimes I'll get a voice wrong when I see who said it, go back and redo it. Um, but I'd rather read it for the first time when I narrate. It's just better that way. All right, guys, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80s slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and here at the end of the narration, end of me talking right now, there's going to be a picture that is going to be obscured and hard to see. If you can tell me who it is and from which Freddy or Evil Dead movie it's from, 
And if you're the first person, I'll get you something uh, really cool like an ebook or PDF or something. Uh, so be sure to drop in the comments as quick as possible if you recognize this picture that's going to pop up in just a second. Like I said, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon. Here's the picture.